I love the Simpsons episode where Homer is given a key to the city of Springfield only to have it later uh, taken back by Mayor Quimby and subsequently given to Homer's best friend, Barney. Now, the mayor takes a closer look at the key and asks, are these teeth marks? To which Homer responds, I thought it was filled with chocolate, which of course is funny, but, but not entirely outlandish. I mean, why do mayors or whatever public uh, representatives give these oversized keys to people? Like, it's not like there's an oversized lock that it can open. It might as well be filled with chocolate, or at least then it would be usable. I'll let you Wikipedia the origin on this somewhat odd tradition. I'll just point out that in Revelation 3, Jesus also has a key of great significance, but probably not oversized or filled with chocolate. Verse 7 begins, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, Right, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Earlier in our study of Revelation, I suggested that each of the messages to the seven churches, which uh, compose Revelations chapter 2 and 3, include a description of Jesus drawn from John's initial vision of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. Now, this is an instance where the vision breaks form. The words holy and true do show up in Revelation, but in chapter 6, verse 10. There it's found on the lips of the slain souls under the altar who call out, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of earth, of the earth and avenge our blood? In the terms holy and true, we again encounter language that is used to describe the Father applying appropriately to the Son. Now, the reference to the keys carried by the one holy and true does have connection back to chapter 1, but in that instance, the keys that Jesus carries are said to be, in verse 18, the keys to death and Hades. It sounds like this is a different key than the key of David. Now, does that mean multiple keys? Or perhaps we're going to be totally literal about this, that Jesus is carrying around a key chain. Obviously, in chapter 9, someone also held the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Maybe that's on the key chain as well. I'll leave that for you to ponder. The key of David does appear previously in Scripture in Isaiah 22. Interestingly, there it's used in reference to Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. That's kind of an obscure reference, isn't it? Like if we were to keep reading through this section of Isaiah, we discover the house of David is another way of talking about the kingdom of God. In demonstrating that he, meaning Jesus, is the one with the key of David in his hands, he's saying, I am the way in. In his commentary on Revelation, Daryl Johnson remarks, many of the believers in Philadelphia were Jews who, because of their faith in Jesus, had the door of the synagogue shut in their faces. They had been excommunicated, cursed, persecuted, and disowned by family and community. Jesus is telling them those doors have been closed. The door into my Father's presence shall never be closed to you. We'll unpack more of this next week, but the the first encouragement, if not challenge in this passage, is that as followers of Jesus, we're going to be ridiculed and rejected perhaps by those closest to us. The comfort Jesus offers is, the, is, the face, uh, is in the face of closed doors and rejection. A door is open and welcome embrace that he makes possible with our Heavenly Father. May this passage challenge and comfort you to greater faithfulness to the one holy and true. Have a blessed week.